Hello and welcome to Vote Chat. We're brought to you by the University of Otago's Department of Politics. Uh, my name is Peter Grace. We're in the university's media production studios. Uh, we're joined by a live audience, and uh, so I'd like to welcome them and also those of you who are joining us on live stream. Uh, as always, we're uh, on Twitter throughout the show, so here's Nicole to give you a little bit about the questions you can ask. Thank you, Peter. So this is the interactive part of Vote Chat 2014. For those of you who are watching us on the live stream, there's the opportunity for you to ask questions of our guest. To do this, log in to Twitter, form your question, and direct it to our Twitter handle, at OUVoteChat, or alternatively, use our hashtag, VoteChat14. We're joined today by Māori Party co-leader Te Urua Flavel. We'll be discussing policy, the controversy around the Māna Party, and what life is like for the Māori Party working closely with National. It is a jam-packed show, but we always make time for your Twitter questions, so please do get them through. You'll catch me here at the Twitter desk later in the show, but for now, it's back to you, Peter. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, well, welcome to Roro. Thank you for joining us. Sure, Peter. Uh, I've got a lot of questions for you. So um, uh, the first one I really would like to get started <coughs> with is, is, is uh, what's been happening with the Maori Party. Um, from, to all intents and purposes, it's gone very quiet. So uh, can you tell us what you've been up to? Uh, probably since halfway through last year we had the change of leadership. I took over the co-leadership role and since then it's very, been very much focused on obviously the business of the day, running the country. Yes. Um, also just organising our own infrastructure to prepare for this year's election. It's meant also uh, the issues such as selecting candidates, organising policy uh, and of course uh, organising for Peter and Tariana's um, departure. So as it happens tomorrow, uh, is our 10th anniversary of the Māori Party uh, in Parliament, so it's uh, been getting around the countryside as well, touching base with people, but just basically uh, consolidating uh, after you know some elements of things that didn't go quite well for us. Uh, but I think that over the last um, three three months or so, I think the tide has turned. I think the, the budget. Uh, uh, document that we put out and showed the gains that we've been able to achieve, the, the rollout of the new uh, Māori housing strategy, the health strategy, Māori health strategy, Māori language strategy have all set the scene pretty much for where we want to go and the budget also gave us a real good focus about um, securing, securing gains on uh, what we've done uh, to this point in time as well as set the scene for the next three years or so. Mm -hmm. So you're going into the election feeling very positive about things? I am. I am. Uh, I've had a, this whole week in the South Island, uh, travelling down from Blenheim with our candidate in Te Tai Tunga, and I've got to say that it uh, was pretty much last minute to get organised because uh, just timetables and stuff, uh, but I've got to say that I'm I've been taken aback actually to the reception that we received at various audiences uh, and that's been over the space of the whole week so I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident about what's happened certainly here and our reception in particular in Dunedin and the other centres but also across the country we're getting good feedback so um, I think that uh, we're in a good positive space and I think to, tomorrow when we celebrate 10 years and of course launch our campaign uh, I think we're in a good space. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, an interesting correlation is what's been happening with mana and internet. Uh, they've been getting a lot of press recently. So, really interested in hearing your views on, on what's <coughs> happening there. Um, you know, particularly uh, uh, the fact that uh, perhaps mana uh, uh, in, in t teeing up with the uh, internet party might be looking like a less radical group than they had previously. What's your feeling on that? Well, to be truthful, I didn't really come here to talk about the no, Mana Party because sure. uh, they got their own space. Yep. Uh, suffice to say that you know how they look is their business. Our role at the moment, I'm not trying to be evasive of it. It's just basically that I'm here to talk about Māori uh, kaupapa and I suppose uh, to sort of capture it in this in this sense that uh, when we entered Parliament, we went in on, on the back of, of this slogan uh, that we'll be a strong, independent Māori voice with influence in Parliament. That was we, we, what we aimed to do, and I believe we've delivered that. We also said that we would protect Māori rights on the back of the foreshore and seabed debacle, but that we would set the scene for the future, and that's where we want to go. So in terms of where we're sitting as the Māori Party versus anybody, anybody else, that we say that we are the Māori Party by brand, uh, that our people are Māori, that our kaupapa is Māori, it comes from a Māori worldview, uh, and that that kaupapa ha will not deviate and has not deviated since we started, that we are here for the best interests of our people as well as the whole country. And therefore, uh, under those, those conditions, you know, everybody else will be different from that. And we say that we are the Māori party that puts Māori issues front and centre, not as a clip-on. 
So if you wanted a response about any other parties, I suppose I'm suggesting that for most of those parties, if not all of them, things Māori are a clip on as opposed to being at front and centre. And that's just the difference that we have. Surely that's not true of the Māna Party, though. They're not, that Māori is not a clip on for them. Well, yes it is, because they've joined up with uh, the Internet okay. Party and therefore their kaupapa is absolutely different. And in fact, we take the view that, uh, that, it, that they are a sort of a class party because um, of the declared position uh, by Hone uh, that they will look after te pani, kore, te pani me te rawa kore, uh, and that is clearly about class issues. So uh, they might have other things that clip on, uh, but uh, they, aren't, they aren't Māori in, in terms of design uh, and... Uh, that that's the difference where we sit. Okay, one of the things that obviously uh, the uh, association that they're having with the Internet Party is, is um, illuminating is uh, this youth vote. Uh, and so, you know, obviously you've got a number of new candidates that you're putting on that are much younger, uh, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, well, um, the candidate we have in Te Tokido is Te Hira Painga. He's pretty young, he's, but he's got a fair few kids. Uh, that, that aside, uh, he's young, he brings that youth vote, he brings a real passion for rangatahi. Uh, he works in the kapahaka with the secondary school kids. Yep. And uh, from what I understand and what I've seen, he's very passionate about youth issues. In fact, that's what he talks about all the time at our, at our hui. Uh, coming down the line, if you did want to catch up with everybody else, we've got Rangi McLean, who's a community person in South Auckland, very much uh, around youth issues because that's what they have to deal with in, in South Auckland. Uh, Sue Cullen, who used to be with Te Wānanga Aotearoa, is Rungo Wetere's uh, daughter, who was the basically founding father of Te Wānanga Aotearoa. You'd understand that her passion is in education and, of course, uh, young people in education. Uh, myself and Wairiki across to Te Tai Hauauru, where Tariana seat is. Chris McKenzie, again, got a young family, um, a sheer passion for rangatahi. And uh, Nori Button, I wouldn't say that she's sort of, I could push it that far that she's, uh, you know, absolutely in the rangatahi realm, because she's not. She's a little bit older, uh, but brings that sort of central gov governance experience because she was the Deputy Mayor of Christchurch. Uh, and of course, on the Ikaroa Rafati side, uh, we have um, uh, Marama Fox, who's a background in education, kōhang reo kura kaupapa, all of her kids. Uh, actually, when I think about it, all of us have got a lot of kids, but that's an aside. Um, what happens is that uh, she brings that experience in kōhang reo kura kaupapa Māori, and she's working in the Ministry of Education uh, on the Māori, Māori language deliveries uh, in terms of Māori language. So that's that's our team. So as a, a new co-leader, is this idea of bringing on peop new people and, and having a succession plan much more your focus? I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, that's pretty much how the whole uh, issues about leadership came a, yes. came a part of the discussion. I was of the belief that we needed to plan for a time when Peter and Tariana moved on. Um, it's all rolled out now, and so we have to build, rebuild the, the, uh, the, the sheer passion again and amongst our people, the faith that they needed, that they had in, the, in us in the past, um, and to, I suppose, paint the picture, which is pretty much what I've been doing on the road, is to paint the picture about where we sit, and I'm sure we're going to get to that anyway, about how, how the Māori Party fits with every other party in Parliament, but more importantly, I suppose, the influence that we've been able to achieve by sitting next to the governing party and where we want to sit in the future. So uh, the idea of uh, success planning is important because I don't intend to stay there forever in a day. Um, in fact, I'll so probably... So what percentage of the people uh, that you have uh, taken to the election are new people? Well, all of the candidates, I accept myself. Right. They're all new to politics, uh, although um, so I'm talk talking national politics, right. but they've all come with varying experiences of, uh, of backgrounds in the community, which is pretty important in terms of the, polit in terms of the political environment. OK, OK. Um, the last election, um, you, the party dropped three seats, uh, so there is, uh, I imagine, a, an element of rebuilding in what you're doing. Um, but you, you know, why did this happen, do you know? Well, we dropped one seat, oh, um, in a sense, because we lost uh, the member of the time, um, and we, we're down, we went, I think when Horne was with us, uh, there was five, yep. then we went down to four, now we're at three. Uh, and you'd understand that because it was all of the things about the split with, uh, the, with Hone moving off to his own party. Uh, you'd understand about the, I suppose, the notion of the country coming to grips with Māori being a part of a governing party. Uh, and um, there were some elements of that. Uh, those are sort of some of the elements, but the biggest question was around those who didn't vote. Uh, the huge number of people who haven't voted in particular Māori but throughout the whole country. And so I'm hoping that the various, in particular some of the student groups that have sort of come up and around Vote Māori Māori, uh, vote, Māori vote, that campaign um, has, is starting to resonate uh, amongst uh, people to get them involved in the voting process. Because as I've been saying to all audiences throughout the country, if you don't vote, you take what you get. 
Yeah, Peter Sharple said on uh, Saturday, I think, uh, that um, there was uh, a, a problem with educating Māori about what Parliament does and, and uh, what the use of Parliament is. Uh, do you agree with that? And, and is this, you'd like to elaborate on that? Well, that's exactly my experience, yeah. is that uh, when I go to, in fact, even at the students group that I was just with now, uh, sort of not a real good understanding um, about how Parliament, what it, how it's made up, and secondly, how it works. That's not to know every detail about it, but just around the whole notions of things that, uh, around the relationship, for example, between the Māori Party and the, and, uh, the National Party, Māori Party and Labour Party, uh, and uh, the fact that National has 59 members of Parliament, they make up the government without the Māori Party because they have ACT and United Future, they've got 61, they're the government, but we supported them for the budget. That's all. We can vote against them. And in fact, over 40 times we voted against them on crucial legislation that has put a stop to some of that, those, uh, that, that, those laws coming into, into being enacted. So all that sort of stuff, it's basic stuff, because one would think that if you understand the whole picture, then you're clearly in a better position to be able to put your vote in the right place, as opposed to going, oh, my nanny's Koro's uncle back in 1942 voted Labour, so I'm going to vote Labour. You know, the times have changed, the political time has changed, and uh, we need to vote for the time, what's right for the nation and where we all fit in the, in the scenario. So you'd like Murray to be more strategic about the way they vote, uh, rather than um, necessarily following the traditions? Well, we have to be. Yep. We have to be. Why would you put your vote where you know it ain't going to count? I mean, under, I mean, right here and right now, most polls say that National's going to gonna scream in. Uh, but MMP says that's not going to be the case. Uh, the rules around MMP say they cannot scream in. They must have partners. And then, therefore, it's not just about the major parties, National or Labour. If you do that, one of them, 50% you know, of the time, you'll be right. It's actually about the smaller parties that are going to join up or otherwise with the National Party to become, or the Labour Party, to be truth, truthful, to make up the government. OK, well, we'll come back to that. We've got our first Twitter question. So, Nicole, could you give us that? Yeah, we've had a question come in surrounding your campaign that you're running. Uh, NZ Election Ads have tweeted in. They would like to know what the Maori Party focus on advertising is going to be. Advertising, does elaborate any further than that? Yeah, so what your, what your main policies are that are going to feature in advertising oh, okay. and whether or not we're going to see that come through in a strong way. Uh, sure. Um, we're not quite in the position to be able to roll out some of our policy um, policy issues right now, but you'd understand that uh, that uh, we believe that what we develop for Māori is in the best interests of the country, um, if we target in that respect, mm -hmm. that our policies are unashamedly aimed in that direction, uh, that it is about... Um, we're sort of moving away from the deficit line. We don't like being in that space, and we want to plan for the future. Um, in terms of building a more prosperous future. So uh, we're tending to move towards economic development as a better way, but also look after those ones, absolutely, uh, that, uh, that might be struggling. We are of the view, by way of whānau water, that it is about empowering families to, to take care of business themselves. Sometimes they just need the tools to be able to do that mm -hmm. through, th through kaupapa like whānau water. But once they've done that, they should be allowed to move ahead into the future and plan appropriately. So our, our, it's a... It's a, it's a focus on whānau, focus on families, uh, with a bill, and that we uh, do not per se agree with the notion that the state should la look after everybody. We're of the view that actually we should be looking after ourselves as whānau, uh, but take care of those who might be struggling from time to time. So pretty much that's where we want to head, if that's helpful. And so can we expect to see that in a cohesive advertising campaign? Is that what we're going to be seeing? Uh, that's uh, so still to be designed because we've got a television uh, um, ads to roll out at the start of the campaign. Brilliant. But that pretty much encapsulates where we want to go. We do not want to be sitting at the side throwing stones. We want to be where the action's at. And as I've been saying to Peter, that's sitting at the table, the decision-making table. If you're not there, you get nothing. Simple as that. And we don't want to get nothing. We actually want to make a difference. So that's, that's pretty much what we're focusing on. I think that that's a really interesting question because there is definitely a balance in politics between the brand and, and spending large amounts of money on advertising on television in particular and, and the grassroots approach. And what we've seen from the major parties uh, over the last 20, 30 years is this move towards it all being about the show and the theatre and a lot less about the, gra the grassroots. What's your view? Is, you know, does the Maori Party balance both, or, or are you much more about, uh, about grassroots? Oh, we've, 
we've always had a campaign of kanohi ki te kanohi, but which basically means face to face. Yep. You can't beat that. Uh, in all the campaigns I've been associated with, there's nothing better than sitting next to the people, eyeball to eyeball, at the same level, talking to them about their issues, hearing what they've got to say, but also getting an opportunity to present what you're all about. Um, so that's just naturally what we do. Kanohi ki te, it's being seen around. Uh, at the various uh, where it's appropriate to be seen, but I mean because there's such huge electorates, you know, we're talking about the Taitonga here in the South Island, which comes from Lower Hutt and Wellington, whole of the South Island, plus Stewart Island, plus the Chathams. That's one person's responsibility as a Māori electorate ca um, candidate. So we can't but not look at the new technology that's available. Sitting in front of a camera right now is, is a, you know, is invaluable because I can't get to every place, nor can our candidate. So we've got to take in, and take in social media, we've got to take in Twitter, we've got to take in Instagram, still learning, but Twitter's good. Um, Facebook, you've got to be there, you know, you just have to, uh, because there is, a, there is an audience there, and generally they're young, and they need to have an opportunity to hear about the issues, they need to, an opportunity to engage, and we've got to respond to that. So it's a balance of both, but I feel more, far more comfortable in the whole notion about face-to-face, -face, talking to people directly. You just mentioned the Maori electorates, and obviously that's something we really want to talk about. Um, uh, it's a contentious issue at the moment. Um, uh, nationals attempted to get rid of them. Uh, it sounds like it's a fight that's going to go on for a very long time. So uh, can you explain to us a little bit more about the value of the Maori seats and, and what would happen if we didn't have any? OK, so the Maori seats have come about, by many, like many other things in the Maori world, by protest. Right. <laughs> uh, they are a part of a bigger scene that Māoridom has taken over our history, our combined history, to find our space in the political arena of this country. And it's taken different forms. The gun to passive resistance, parihaka, it's flags on top of hills, it's, it's hikoi, it's petitions, it's kingitanga, it's joining political parties, it's making your own political parties. And the Māori Party is a part of that big picture of activism why Māori them to find our space in the political environment? If we don't go there, then we rely on the other political parties. And the history tells us, if you are a Māori as a part of a bigger party, like, uh, like democracy, you, you don't get anywhere. You don't. Uh, that's what the force on seabed issue told us right from the start. So what better than to have your own political movement called a Māori party? That's the first part. Uh, the second part is that uh, National had, uh, when they first came into government, um, uh, on their uh, manifesto that they would get rid of the Māori seats. They took that off. <laughs> Why? Because the Māori party told them to get it off there or else no deal. And so they took it off and said that they would not revisit that until Māori was ready. Now, that would never have happened had we not been in a position to negotiate. Simple Is Māori ever going to be ready to have those removed? I hope not. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> never ever, because it is our space. It's our space to be able to claim to take up an opportunity to be at the, the governing table, depending on which party you're in. I mean, you know, uh, if you sit within Labour and you're a Labour member of Parliament, uh, and, and Tariana has told us this, she sat in a caucus of 30, 30 people when they raised it as a huge Māori caucus. Issues within the Labour caucus when she was there, at every point they were banged. So it tells us. It must be like that. You don't get a say. Tauhenare, as an active member of the National Party this year and in the past three years, from time to time, has spoken against the stand taken by his government, but voted with it. Why? Because it goes like this. There's the door. <laughs> if you don't follow the line, there's the door. Goodbye. So he's chosen to take the door now. He's, uh, he's uh, finished up, and, um, and I think you know, that's just how it is. Whereas so you're saying that the only way that Māori can, can maintain a voice is by keeping the electorate seats? Keeping the, well, not so much that, certainly that's a part of it, yep. but in order to be effective and make change, because now you're having the electorate seats if you don't do anything with them, you've got to be at the seat of the table, you know? And that's the thing around with respect to the Mana Party is that the Mana, mana Party have utilised that Māori seat hard fought for to drag in some people who may or may not have any commitment to kaupapa Māori, or more to the point, dragged in a few million dollars on the back of getting into Parliament. I can't hold that against them. Hell, we all go fundraising. I haven't got a problem with that. But I have got a problem with utilising a Māori seat hard fought for to allow other people to come in. I'm really interested in this, this, um, this, this corollary you're showing of uh, radicalisation about protests, about, about having to fight for your right, and then the idea of being permanently at the government table. 
because the the other view of that is is one of conservatism, of of um, of uh, playing the game. Well, they they can work in combination. Right. I mean, at one hand. There is no problem with protest. I mean, it's great because it keeps you sharp. <laughs> it keeps you, keeps you focused. It keeps the community alive about, you know, what, what are the issues in the community. And it, long may it live. I've been there. I've been at the front of the protest line. Um, you know, I've been there. And that's about prodding the consciousness of the country. But the pure world of politics, as commentators far better than me have said it, it comes down to compromise. We are three members, 59 on the other side with the National Party. We don't win every battle but we're in a far better place to be able to secure both funding through the ministerial portfolios, through the party portfolio, and through uh, um, a negotiation with the government that allows us to achieve what we did. $3 billion over the last six years has been specifically money targeted at Māori communities. You can't, like, you can't just let that go, and that's the issue. I suppose if the Māori party wasn't there, where would we be in terms of Māori issues? And even the National Party members uh, acknowledge that, that the Māori Party, that X Factor Māori Party, has brought a totally different um, dimension to how the National Party feels about issues Māori, uh, and I, I suspect the country as a whole. OK, I, I would really love to be able to talk about this more because this is the but that really drives me and I'm interested in, but we do need to move on. And, and uh, with respect to your being here, I think I need to ask you some questions about your policy. Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, this election is a very important one for you. Uh, in a sense, it's a make and break one. So what are the three big issues that you've got moving into the election? What are the ones that you think are going to vote, uh, catch votes? Yeah, well, I, I can't tell you now because I'll have to take you out because tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow we have our 10th anniversary. Okay, well, what are the issues then? Well, the issues that most people talk about are issues of, of housing, yep. of employment or unemployment, and the economy, and, and health that are all linked in a sense, and even poverty is right up there as well. We've taken the view that rather than say, when somebody asks me, what's your policy on housing, or what's your policy on health, we're taking another view, which is, we don't have a policy on housing, we don't have a policy on health per se. What we have a policy on is whānau. If you fix whānau, then everything else comes from that. If you have a focus on Fano, then everything else comes from that. So that's where we want to line up. A focus on Fano, making Fano resilient, empowered, the ability to get on with life and that, and that takes in having a job, having a warm, safe house, having kids that are well cared for and not abused, having kai on the table, having uh, uh, being, uh, the ability to go and get health services when they're needed. And that's why, even in the last budget, you'd see that our focus is on tamariki and whānau, that, for example, the, the one that we had over uh, children up to 13 years of age being able to have access to, directly to uh, medicine and the doctors, uh, the paid parental leave, the tax credits, those are stuff that we motivated through, the pilot, through, through our negotiations with the government at the last budget round. So it's, uh, it's our focus is on whānau, it's on whānau order, which, in, which means well families. Okay. Uh I'd like to push you a little bit harder on this one because uh, we had uh, the Conservative uh, Party candidate uh, and leader um, Colin Craig here on the studio a couple of months ago and he made a comment about refer referendums and saying that uh, he wanted uh, their party to be a referenda-based party, which was effectively that they would go out to the nation every time there was something that needed to be talked about and have a referendum on it. Uh, do you see that that's a bit of a cop-out? Do you see that there's a, a tendency for political parties to not have policies, but to have well-stated intentions? Well, yeah, you always have well-stated intentions, and that's why I say, uh, you know, election time is, cl is classic. We can stand in front of audiences and say, I'll give you 20 lo lollies, and somebody else will give you 30. Well, actually, that's all good, but it comes down to what happens after an election. That's where, because I still have, Labour, for example, for the last years, still has 30 lollies, and I had 20, but I've also got a collection of another set of lollies from the National Party that has allowed me to get the best interest. You've got to find a way paying for those lollies too. Oh, pardon? You've got to find a way of paying for those lollies And too. you can. You can negotiate through that. Uh, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. But can you deliver it? That's the issue. Uh, because you forever be in political isolation unless you're able to deliver it. Um, or else you'll always be a protest party. Now, we've matured. You know, as a people about utilising still the protest action at one end, because that's still going to go on, uh, and being at the political table to be able to get the very best that we can. I mean, I would have thought that that's 
that's naturally taken as being read that you have a parliament that is about the best interests of the country. How we get there, of course, is, is the bigger debate right. because every party has a different way of getting to the end result and we want to be, be a part of that debate and be at the table. Okay. Well, Nicole's got another question for you from our Twitter friends. Yeah, so you've been talking about how you don't exist in isolation. We've had a question come in about the fact that you are working with National um, to try and further the cause of Māori. Kitty Higby has tweeted in and she'd like to know what reforms you've supported that have not been in the best interests of Māori. Not too many that I can recall uh, because they're against Māori aspirations and, and dreams. So I said we, you know, about 40 pieces of legislation we've stopped. The classic one right here and right now is the Resource Management Act. Uh, so the Resource Management Act, the, the National Party did a huge amount of work to get it to a point where they actually wanted to get it into Parliament for first reading. We said, some of those things, they're not too bad. But, hold on, we have advice that says that the economic imperative have over, has overridden the environmental protections. We won't support it. It's stopped. Can't go anywhere. Because both Peter Dunn and ourselves have said no to that. Uh, and now that John Banks is gone, <laughs> we have the crucial vote. They can't put it into Parliament this year, not even to first reading. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it's stopped in its tracks. And that's generally how we've operated. So, you know, to understand the relationship, as I said before, National has 59. You've got uh, John Banks with ACT, United Future, they had 61. That is the number that you need to govern. The Māori Party has three. We are the insurance policy for one vote only. That's for the budget. We only support the budget. And our, we have a, a clause called the Agree to Disagree Clause that says that if the National Party, as the government, puts up legislation, we only have to say, well, we can say no, number one. And the other condition is a pretty hard one. We just have to tell them. So we just tell them quite regularly that we don't agree with their policy, uh, state assets, uh, those sorts of some, of the, some of the social welfare reforms we didn't agree with. But they will still go through because they still have those two votes from United Future and Act generally. So we try to work with the other parties if it's appropriate. And we, well, actually, we don't go and negotiate at all. Mm -hmm. We state our case, and if they come our way, awesome. If they don't, we just got to accept that they've already got 61, therefore the legislation will pass. But as I say, there have been times when we've actually stopped legislation. Um, and another piece of legislation is to do with veterans and um, allowances for those uh, to do with when they die and what happens to their um, the paying the bills and stuff like that. Uh, that that's in Parliament at present. Uh, we gave our view that we weren't prepared to, uh, we, that we were prepared to support it um, only if the door was opened up to a far wider um, sector of the veterans. They agreed because they wanted that legislation passed. We gave our votes. It's going to pass when it does come back in, but I, I suspect it's not going to be on the agenda between now and the end of Parliament, which is only about four weeks away, mm -hmm. and therefore they'll probably hang it up till next year. So that's how we operate. Uh, no surprises, but an agree to disagree clause. We've got about 10 minutes left, uh, so there's a couple of things I'd like to address in, those, in that time. Um, the first one is, is one about inequality. Uh, it's a buzzword at the moment, uh, and obviously different parties have different views on uh, whether we have a problem or not, whether the rich are getting poorer, uh, richer and the poor are getting poorer, uh, and how that's affecting the makeup of the country. I'd be really interested in your view on that. Sure. Uh, well, we'd, we'd say that we do have that problem. Um, and I suppose it's, the next question is, well, what are you going to do about it? We can do some things, but we tried to take the approach that we needed to, to put it on the agenda, because that's right on the agenda in front of the government. We chose to uh, have a ministerial committee on, uh, of investigation into poverty that was co-chaired by the Minister of Finance, Bill English, and Tariana. So we put it front and centre in, term, in terms of a ministerial uh, focus on issues to do with poverty. That's at one line. And the second part is to say, well, what can we do within our uh, influence? Uh, we looked at things like, um, what does poverty look like? How, how do you address those things? And so uh, the issues around going to the doctor is a direct influence of stuff that came out of that. We had the inquiry uh, into the issues associated with health affecting on Māori uh, children that was sponsored through the Māori Affairs Select Committee and a report is written again on that. We've tried to pick up on the recommendations of the ministerial inquiry into these issues. So as I say, coming back to the practical things, uh, the doctor's visits is one, uh, the insulation of houses is, is, uh, is two. We've had um, um, over 20,000 houses have been insulated at low decile areas. Uh, so that's the health, the, the, um, 
the swabs for, bar for um, rheumatic fever has been a focus because that's a direct, there's a direct correlation between that and, and housing and being cold and our children's health. So all of those sorts of stuff are starting to line up as practical changes. That, I mean, they're not everything, but they are certainly practical changes that we've tried to, ha to have influence over to address that. The bigger picture around poverty is something that you can't just go boom, one, one way, one hit. Right. It's got to be a wider look at it across the board um, in terms of more money for whānau, which is why, we, why we've advocated a living wage of $18 plus uh, in order to get more money into, into people's ha hands to be able to pay, for, pay the bills. Um, we've looked at things like uh, warrant of fitness on rental housing because some of the state of the ha state houses as well as rental houses is some cases pretty pitiful. And that does, I mean, is across the board. It's not as if they're sort of one hit, one hit wonder. It's a, trying to take a, a big approach and not, and to deal with it in the best interests of whānau at the centre again. You're sitting at the table though with uh, the National Party, which is the, the Businessmen's Party, for the want of a better description. Do you f see a willingness to um, talk about these things or is there a, a roll the door that comes down when you ask questions about poverty and, and rich people? An element of both. Yeah. Uh, that, sure, we put it on the agenda at the highest level by way of the ministerial committee, but even Tariana said, come on, come on people, we, we aren't making any moves here, and, and, and slammed the table a couple of times, which is why we've been able to move some of these individual things that come out of that as the best hit. I mean, we're three members of parliament, we're sitting, yes, across from national, we don't get our way at every opportunity. We definitely don't get our way. In fact, they say we're probably a whole hard to them because we, we, we go hard, but we don't get everything. Um, the things that we have got have been well fought for, hard fought for. Um, and so it's our effort uh, to move this country and indeed the National Party to deal with those issues that we must confront as a country. So where are we at with treaty negotiations? How involved are you with the National Party's approach to treaty negotiations? And, and where do you see it heading? Well, I'm not a minister, so I'm not directly in re responsible for that, and those negotiations are directly, directly between the Crown and Iwi. Uh, so I have been involved in sort of keeping an eye on how things are going, but Iwi take care of their own business, and so they deal directly with the minister. The role that the Māori Party has had is that uh, the process must be signed off by the Minister of Māori Affairs, Peter Sharple, so that's where we come in. Yep. Um, and people obviously lobby us about concerns that they might have, but once the people have got them, then that's fine. And I think the good development that's arisen under Chris Finlayson is not only a fierce determination to get those done, uh, but also um, having the backup of having a unit set aside within treaty settlements that maintains an ongoing relationship to iwi. Because in the past they've said, here's the money, where you go, Māori, going to do something with it. Now it's, where you go, but how long, let's have that ongoing relationship. Yes. So in the next uh, three weeks or so, uh, the Tuhoi Bill will be passed. In, in its entirety and a part of that is maintaining an ongoing relationship with the Office of Treaty Settlements and indeed the Minister. Another bill in my area, Ngāti Whare, a very small community called Minginui in the middle of nowhere in the forest. A small community had, was a thriving community way back in the day but now uh, you know they've got housing issues, they've got health issues, they've got unemployment and so uh, while they did get a package of X million dollars they also have a package around the social imperative to keep to keep uh, to look after the families in that community. So we're pleased in that regard um, because our part is to sit alongside the iwi to make sure that all the bases are covered, not the actual settlement per se, but making sure that the Crown for its part honours its part. Will this move towards a, a sense of autonomy like the Tuhoi thing mean that, that the Māori Party becomes even more important at the, at the, at the government tables? Um, well, with or without, with or without because uh, you know, some iwi have settled a long time ago. Some, and, and at the at the end of at the end of the day, it's the people in like the people in this huge audience we got here this morning uh, are, are going to be the ones that will still have issues. They don't get you know uh, five dollars in the back pocket from settlements. It doesn't happen like that. I can't think. Uh, sure, they might get education grants. They might get uh, some fish when there's a tangi on, but actually they don't benefit too much. And so their issues of issues of you know warm housing, of health, of wanting to go to university, the high university fees, etc., are always going to be there. Therefore, the Māori Party should be at the table no matter what happens in the settlement space. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I, I hope we get a chance to have you back again to explore those ideas more in depth uh, in the future. Um, but uh, it's been great having you on thank the show. Thank you very much. I really thank enjoyed you. it. Yeah. Well,
Well, thank you also for joining us on Vote Chat. Uh, uh, we've got um, a couple of things I'd just like to, to touch on before we go. Uh, we were running a bit late today, so uh, our apologies on, on that. Uh, but also, um, uh, this is a student-run uh, uh, show, and we have great contributors from um, our research people, so I'd also like to thank them for the questions today. Uh, we're joined next week uh, by Julian Crawford, who is the uh, Aotearoa uh, legalised cannabis uh, candidate uh, and leader, I think, uh, if I'm I hope I'm right. Uh, and he's standing in for Bill English, who is unable to join us. Uh, so that'll be an interesting juxtaposition. So please come along for that. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining us.